Right. So I see we have a few people with us. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Dr. Christy Mulkey and I'm the workshop coordinator with 240 Tutoring and I'm here live in our FTCE study and test prep Facebook group to do some work on the GK math. So if you've been tuning in with us live the last few weeks, we've been working through the competencies for the GK math and we've done competencies one, two, and three. So if you've missed those, I highly recommend you go check them out. Today, we're gonna to be working through competency four. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that we can get started. I'm just making sure everything's working. Yes, looks like picture and sound are both working. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can follow along. All right, so hopefully you're seeing my PowerPoint. Okay. All looks to be working on my end. So we're going to jump right in. So last week we finished up competency three. Today we're going to look at competency four. And again, these competencies have a lot of things in them. And so what we're going to do is break that into two parts. And my mouse is just kind of lost on me here. We're going to break that into two parts. So today we're going to look at skills three through five. And then next week, we'll look at the other skills within competency four. So remember, this is specific to your state, your test. I'm going to go over the competency, so standards, walk you through some strategy, do a little teaching, and provide some explanation. So let's take a look at what we're looking at today. So this is competency four. And normally, I kind of split them in half, like I take the top half and the bottom half. But I tried to pull apart the things that worked well together. And there are lots of questions in the release preparation materials that look at just these three things. And so that's what we're going to look at today. So those things that relate to central tendency, all right, looking at those data sets and statistics. Next week, we will look at graphing, interpretation of data, probability and surveys and experiments. So we'll be looking at that next week. So um, skills one and two, six and seven. Now, I wanna talk about this competency in general, and I wanna point out something right here. We're talking about competency four. You can see that noted right here. Competency four is 33% of your exam. 33% of your exam. It's actually the most heavily weighted of all of them. It's the most heavily weighted of all the competencies. And I actually love that for you guys. All right. Here's what I like to call this competency is the biggest bang for your buck. It's the bang for your buck competency. It's the most heavily weighted. So it impacts your score more than any other competency. And it's the easiest to reteach yourself. So like if you watch the last couple of weeks videos on competency three and competency two, that math was difficult. I will not lie. If you haven't done algebra in a long time, remembering what a function is and how to graph it, remembering how to find surface area and volume of a three dimensional figure, that's much more difficult than this math. This I can review today. You might can do a little more review and practice on your own and you'll be set. This is the easier of the competencies to reteach yourself. It doesn't mean it requires no thinking or no skill at all. It's just the easiest to reteach yourself. So here is where if you are in a short time period before your test and you're not doing well on math practice, I often suggest go look at your scores for competency four on the last test. If you didn't do very well, this is a place where you can study for a day or two, refresh, practice, and you can boost your score quite a bit just by looking at this math content because the math itself is not that difficult, okay? So bang for your buck competency. Competency four, it's weighted the most. And it's easy to reteach. So speaking of reteaching, let's jump right in and do some reteaching. So there are some things, some terms about central tendency that you need to know. 
I would highly recommend flashcards for these. You just need to know them. You need to know what they mean and you need to know how to find them. Okay. So make you some little flashcards for these four things. Now, first let's talk about mean. So if we look at mean, the mean is found by adding all the numbers that you're giving, getting that sum and dividing that sum by the numbers, the number of numbers in that data set. So if you had six numbers, you'd find their sum, divide that sum by six. That's going to give you the mean. The mean is often referred to as the average. So we're looking at the average of those numbers. So you need to know what that is and how to find it. The second one is median. Now the median is basically the number in the middle when they're put in order from least to greatest or greatest to least. I usually go least to greatest, but you will get the same thing regardless of which way you go. So it's that number in the middle of the data set. So you're going to put it in order from least, least to greatest and then find the number that's in the middle. And I'm going to do a sample for you so you can see how easy that is. If it's an even set of numbers, let's like say there are six numbers, there's not going to be a number right in the middle. And if that's the case, you just find the average of the two in the middle. And I'll show you a mental math trick to make that go a little bit faster. Then mode is the most frequent number that occurs in the data set. Super easy to find. Just look at the one that occurs the most often. Sometimes it's easier to look at that list from least to greatest, and then it's real easy to see which one occurs most often. Now I have range in a different color here, and the reason being is all the rest of these numbers are looking for that, that measure of center if we were to graph them. All right, the range is looking at the difference between the lowest value and the highest value, okay? So in general, the greater the range, the more the number set is spread out. It could actually indicate an outlier as well. And I'll talk about what an outlier is in just a minute. So as you can see, this competency is really tied to your knowledge of some math vocabulary. Do you know what these things mean and can you find them? So again, I highly recommend flashcards to help you get this down. Because again, you're gonna get a lot of your bang, bang for your buck in that studying. So let's do some practice questions. You're gonna be amazed at how fast these move. So this one's number 33 and it says, the children in a family are ages two, two, six, 12, six, 16, 19, and 20. I think about that many children in one family, all those ages, and I get a little paranoid, so I stuttered a little. What is the mean of the children's ages? Those of you with children, you know what I'm talking about. Now, I want to note that all of these questions come from the free public practice questions provided on the FTCE website. So if you want to check those out, that's what we've been working through in all these videos. But basically here, you know the mean, we're looking for the average. The steps to that, sum. You can use a calculator. For that or you can quickly add them up i'm going to just pull out my calculator here and guys you're going to have a basic four function calculator so you can put that um you can use your phone calculator it does the same basic things so i've got two two and six i'm going to do a little mental math there two and two is four and six is ten so i can type in ten plus twelve plus sixteen plus nineteen plus twenty and that's going to give me seventy seven if I want to count how many numbers I have, I can just cross them off. That makes it a little easy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You need your calculator to do that. I hope not, but 77 divided by seven is 11. So B is your answer choice. This should go really quickly, especially with a calculator. So these are gimme questions. Once you know how to find mean, it should go really, really fast. All right, let's look at another one. My mouse is still being a little haywire with me today, so we'll just resort to the keyboard. Okay, it says, if the company would like to give the impression that its employees are highly paid, which salary statistics should it use? So now this question's a little bit harder. You have to know what all of them mean. So first thing I'm gonna do is note that it says highly paid, all right? It says highly paid. So that's what we're looking at. We want the largest number possible. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to calculate all of these things really quickly to see which one would result in the highest number. Okay. Now you can do a lot of this with some mental estimation if you're short on time, if you're near the end of the test, but you can actually do the computation. 
So minimum is the smallest of the values. So if we just look here, that's simply 15,000. So I'm just gonna write 15K out by that one. The mode, if you remember, the mode is the number that occurs most frequently. Well, these are already in order for us, so it's real easy to see. The number that occurs most frequently is 15K. So I'm gonna write that by the mode. The median is gonna be the number in the middle when they're put in order from least to greatest or greatest to least. So they've already done that for us. So I'm just gonna mark these off one on each end to see where the middle is. Sometimes visually that's very helpful. Now I can see there's clearly one number in the middle. I've marked off three on each end. So the median is also 15K. You probably know the answer without even doing the math. All right, you know these can't all be the answer, right? And so you know that D is gonna have to be the answer, the mean. But if you wanna check that out, you can quickly do that on your calculator. So I'm gonna pull up my calculator. I have 120,000 plus I have 40,000. And you could have done some mental math to make this easier, 60,000. And then I've got two sets of 15. So I'm gonna put 30,000 just to make this easier, 30,000. And I get 280,000. There are seven things listed there. So I can divide that by seven and I get 40,000. So if I were to write that right here, 40K, and we want to show the highest salary possible, the mean would be the best. And I want to show you, you can do a little mental math here. I'm going to make sure our video is still working. Yes. You can do a little mental math, guys. I did, I'm going to erase just so you can see a little bit better. Eraser. Okay, let me turn the pin back on. Maybe. <laughs> Use the keyboard shortcut. Okay. Nope. There we go. I did a little mental math. I said, well, the 60 and 40 is going to be 100K. And then I've got 30 and 30. So that's 160. And then real quickly, 120, I can reduce the amount of math I've needed, 280K divided by seven. Well, if I know 28 divided by seven equals four, then I know this is 40K, all right? So you can do a little bit of mental math. I wrote a little out there, but you can do that in your head to speed up the process a little bit. So pretty easy question. You just have to know how to work through it. All right. So this one, it requires just some good reading. Just read carefully. Eight pumpkins were picked from a garden. Their weights were eight pounds, three pounds, seven pounds, 16 pounds, eight pounds, 13 pounds, 12 pounds, and one pound. How much greater than the mean was the heaviest pumpkin? So it's asking us how much greater when we want to figure out the difference between two numbers, how much bigger, smaller something is, we know we're going to do subtraction. And then it says, then the mean. So we know we're going to have to find the average. All right. And then it says the heaviest pumpkin, which if you look at this list is 16 pounds. Okay. So we've got to find the average, we've got our heaviest pumpkin, and we know we're going to subtract. So this is not difficult to do. If you want to do this on the calculator, you absolutely can. But I'm going to write out these numbers vertically just to show you some mental math. Now, of course, if I was doing this mentally, I wouldn't write it out this way. But you can't see inside my head, so I'm going to write it out this way just to show you some tricks I do mentally. Whenever I'm adding, subtracting, whatever, this is what we teach young children, is we want to make as many tens as possible. So I'm gonna make tens. I know seven and three is a 10. I know eight and two is a 10, all right? I know six, three, that's nine, and one more is a 10. And then I've got that eight hanging out there. 
and three more tens over here. I could just simply count by tens, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and the eight is 68. Now, of course, you can put that in a calculator if that's more comfortable for you, but just know you can do a little mental math. You can even, when I read this, I read across the row. I was like, three and seven is, and I just, I held up my fingers, 10. Um, six, three, and one is another 10. And so I didn't even write all that down when I was doing this math. And we have 68 and we've got how many pumpkins? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so we're looking at 68 divided by eight. And that might be where a calculator is helpful, 8.5, okay? You can do that on your calculator. And now we know if the heaviest pumpkin was 16 pounds, 16.0, and the mean is eight and a half, we can subtract. And again, you can do, use your calculator and it will go faster and you'll get seven and a half pounds. So I hope you're seeing these aren't nearly as difficult as the math we've been doing the last few weeks, okay? So hopefully you're feeling a little bit more confident as we progress here. Let's look at this one. What is the median of the numbers in the following data set? Guys, if you just know this is no number in the middle, it's actually really easy to do and you can do it very quickly. I'm gonna list these numbers in order from greatest to least. And I cross them off just to make sure I don't forget one. Eight, and then another eight, and then I've got 12. And then I can easily see I have three 14s. All right, now I'm just gonna find the number in the middle. So I'm just gonna cross one off each end so I get to the middle. And did I leave out a number? Oh, I did the classic mistake. See why I crossed them off? They're not three 14s. There are four 14s. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. So really, if we cross these off here, I'm going to double X them so I can count them now. And then one on this end, one on this end, one on this end, one on this end. And I've actually got two numbers in the middle. I'm looking at 12 and 14. Do you see why I crossed them off? All right, I've been teaching for years and even I made that mistake. Visually, your eyes will just play tricks on you. I could say that was a teachable moment. I did that on purpose just to show you the value of the strategy, but I'll be honest, I didn't. And so now you can really see the value of the strategy of if you're just eyeballing this, it's really easy to forget a number in your list. So cross them off as you're making your list. Now, when we have two numbers in the middle for the median, we basically just find the average. And you could add that. 12 plus 4 is 26. 26 divided by 2 would be 13. But guys, the average is looking for that number in the center. So when I only have two numbers, and I want to find the average of those two numbers. When I have a longer list, I need to do the steps. But if I only have two numbers, I'm going to look for the number in the middle. That's going to be the average. So what's in between 12 and 14? 13. In fact, it's the only answer choice in between 12 and 14. So you didn't even have to find the actual average of those two numbers or the mean. So the median is looking for the number in the middle when put in order from least to greatest or greatest to least, okay? So remember that strategy as you make your list, cross them out so you don't forget one. Okie dokie. We're gonna move on to the next question. This one says, a basketball coach would like to know the total number of points a team scored in a 15 game season, which of the following measures would provide the coach the additional information needed to make this determination. This is probably the hardest question in this competency that they give us, or out of these skills in this competency, because it just requires some thinking. So let's figure out what do we know and what do we want to know. What we're trying to find is we would like to know the total number of points. So that's what we're trying to get. We want to know that total number of points. All we know right now is that it was a 15 game season. We have 15 games. 
okay? So that's all we know. We want something that will give us this total. So let's think about this, all right? What of these actually works with a total? All right, think about that. Range is the difference between the largest and the smallest. Mode is the number that occurs the most often. Mean is the number, or median is the number in the middle. Mean is the average, and we find the sum, which is the total. So hopefully you think it's mean already, but let's actually plug that in. So if we were gonna find the mean, we would need the sum of all the scores divided by, or the sum of all the points, I should probably write that as points. All right, the sum of all the points divided by the number of games, 15 games. So if we knew the median, or the mean, if we knew the mean, we could actually use a little algebra. If we know this, and we want to know that sum, and we know there are 15 games, we know these two numbers, we could just do a little algebra to basically get this equation where the sum is isolated. I can multiply both sides by 15 games. And so now I have 15 times that mean that we have, and it would give us the total points. Okay, so this one just requires some logical reasoning, but the correct answer here is mean. Now, if I lost you, hopefully you can just pick up on the fact that the only one here, the only measure of central tendency listed here that would help us with determining a total, the only one that finds a total is mean because we find the total of the data set given or that sum. So hopefully that made that click for you. Let's look at another one. We have two more. So a teacher gives a test and notes that the mean is 79 points and the standard deviation is two points. Which of the following is the best interpretation of result? This is basically, do you know what standard deviation is? So I'm gonna draw a normal distribution curve for you. You've all seen this. It looks something like this. Now forgive what will likely not be a very normally distributed curve a distributed curve, okay? And a very crooked line down the middle, a normal distribution curve. Now, when we do this, this line down the middle, all right, is we get a normal distribution curve when the mean and the median are equal or the same, all right? When the mean and the median are the same, then we know that we have a normal distribution curve. That doesn't tell us that in this problem, and that's okay, but I want you to understand what that distribution curve means. And so it's telling us that if we were to draw this, even if it wasn't normal, if it was skewed one way or the other, that the mean is 79 points. So that would mean right here at this point on this line is 79, okay? Now, standard deviation, basically, here's the complicated version, and I'll tell you the simple version, is the standard deviation is calculated to indicate the extent of the deviation for a group as a whole. So in everyday terms, it's how far from normal or the mean. So it's how far the measures are spread out. So usually how you've seen this shown on a graph is you'll see a line here and a line here, and this will be a standard deviation and a standard deviation, okay? And what it's telling us is there's a standard deviation of two points, this way and this way, okay? It's gonna go both directions. Standard deviation is gonna go both directions. Well, if I go two points below 79, I'm gonna get 77. If I go two points above 79, I'm gonna get 81. And you can see by the curve that the bulk of those scores are gonna be between those two numbers. So let's work through these answer choices. It says the median test score is equal to 79 points. 
Now, if we knew this was a normal curve, that could be correct. That could be correct, but it didn't tell us that. So it could have looked like this. It could have been, skewed one direction and we could have said that median of 79 was right here or that mean of 79 forgive me that mean it does not mean it was the median if it were the median as well then it would say it was a normal distribution so in this case that's not correct and that's probably the most tricky of the answers most of the test scores are between 77 and 81 that's exactly what this is telling you when it says there's a standard deviation of two points Two points either way, 77 and 81. Half of the test scores are greater than 81. No, half would probably be greater than 79, so that's not correct. The lowest test score is 77. No, on any curve, you're probably going to have one way lower than that. So the correct answer here is B. So just understanding that standard deviation, if it says it's a standard deviation of five, you're going to go down five and up five from that mean. All right, so the mean is in the, right there. You're going to go up that standard deviation and down. And it's just telling you that the bulk of the scores fell in that range or the bulk of the data fell in that range. So hopefully you understand that. Remember, standard deviation is how far from that mean the measures are spread out. How far from that mean the measures are spread out. You can have more than one standard deviation. It can keep going a little bit, but that's another lesson another day. All right, last question together. This is another one that requires a little bit of thinking. The owner of a roller skating rink needs to purchase women's skates. After reading that the mean women's shoe size is a seven, the owner decides to purchase mostly women's size seven skates. Which of the following statements, if true, best supports the owner's decision? So here, you really just have to know about each of those terms and figure out how it relates to purchasing shoes. So here, median is we're looking for that number in the middle. So the median would be the number in the middle if we listed them all out from greatest to least, okay? The range would be the difference difference between the largest and smallest value. The mode would be the number that occurs most frequently. And the mean would be the average. So it's already saying that he read that the mean women's shoe size is a seven. So we already know that the mean is a seven. So let's talk through each of these and figure out which one would impact how many shoes you buy. Now, I want you to think about this. You could have women who go into skate, and you could have a woman like my daughter who goes into skate who has an abnormally small foot and wears like a youth four. So if you size that up into women, she's barely a five, barely a size five, which is not common. Okay. And then my best friend, has a size 10 shoe. My cousin has a size 11 and a half for a woman. So when you throw in those really small or really large, it can actually throw off your median or your range. Okay. It can throw off your median or your range. So if the median shoe size is really small, that really doesn't tell us a whole lot because it can be thrown off more by those outliers, those numbers in our data set that are really high or really low, and there's not very many of them, maybe only one. The range of the shoe size is fairly large. That's not very helpful. The mode of the shoe size is equal to the mean, okay? So here's the thing. If I were going to buy shoes and I owned a roller skating rink, I wouldn't even look at the mean. I would look at which one is needed most often. So if I pulled a data set of the shoe size that was pulled every day, I would look for the one that occurred the most often. And so if that is the mode and it's equal to this mean of seven, then that makes sense. 
that you would choose that size. The mean of the shoe side is equal to the median. Remember that median can be thrown off if you have an outlier out there, more likely than the other measures. So the best answer here is the mode of the shoe size is equal to the mean. Because in reality, if the owner were going to do this, they'd probably pull the mode more likely than they would the average or the mean. Okay? So hopefully that deep thinking question wouldn't throw you off. But what I want to show you is if you are using our study guide in 240 tutoring, you will now see videos in the instructional content. Look at those right there. Everywhere you see this little play button is a video that will teach you this stuff. So if you need more than what I gave you today and you're using our study guide, you can certainly log in and see a video on measures of center and range. Okay. So just know that those videos are there in our instructional content. Also in our instructional content, so right there is if you're a user of 240 Tutoring, those videos will be under instructional content, but know that we have flashcards and we have quizzes. So you do some instructional content, you study the flashcards, you take a quiz. If you did well, okay, take another quiz and practice. If you did well, okay, take another one and get some more practice. If you don't do well, you know you can go back to the instructional content, back to those flashcards, and study some more. So before you get to taking another full-length practice test where it takes half of your day, then you can do these little quizzes to monitor your study and your progress. Notice we do have a whole section on statistics and data, this competency four. Now, I'm going to recommend, like I have in every other video that we've done about the Florida GK Math, that you know test format you know types of questions, that you're aware that there may be field questions, so you may have a few more than it says you will have. Know what the screen looks like, practice that. Practice with the on-screen four-function calculator and using that reference sheet. That's really important on geometry and measurement questions that you use that. And then I'm always gonna suggest you work on your pacing, things to increase your speed. Remember, this competency, competency four, those mean, medium, mode questions, oh my goodness, you should be able to move through those quickly to allow you more time on the harder questions that involve algebra or measurement or geometry. All right, here's that reference sheet. Again, you can see it's geometry and measurement heavy. Now, if you would like more information, I highly suggest you check out our free resources. You can see a diagnostic test here and a whole bunch of other helpful things. And if you would like to check out our study guides, you can go to 240tutoring.com slash study guides. All of these videos that I've done here are on our Facebook group page. They are also on YouTube under an FTCE study and test prep group playlist. So if you want to go back and see any more of these, you can do that. Now, next week will be our final GK Math video. We will go through those last four skills under competency four. So I hope to see you again next Tuesday live right here in our Facebook group at 11 o'clock Central Standard Time, or you can check us out again on YouTube at any time. Thank you so much for your time, and I wish you all the best on your test and in your preparation. Again, I'm Dr. Christy Mulkey with 240 Tutoring.